Um, at this point, I'm actually going to invite you uh, to open up the scriptures. If you could grab the, the pew back Bibles and the uh, little seat thing in front of you. And we're going to open up to Matthew chapter nine, Matthew chapter nine. And this is going to be on page seven in the New Testament. So as you flip through the scriptures, there's about six, 700 pages of the Old Testament. You're going to go past those. And then the New Testament starts again at one. And you can find page seven there. We'll be in Matthew chapter nine, beginning in verse nine. And this is what the, the word of the Lord says. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. And as he sat at dinner in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came and were sitting with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? When he heard this, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, Well, I don't know if you have ever um, had the experience of waking up in the middle of the night to uh, loud, aggressive shouting outside of your window, uh, followed by gunshots. Uh, But I hope that you don't have to experience that. Uh, This is something that I experienced about five years ago uh, while my wife and I were living in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, Praise the Lord that my wife and our oldest son was, they were out of town that day. Um, But we lived in a parsonage. So it was a a house that the church owned that was connected by way of an underground tunnel to our church building. And right outside our bedroom window was our driveway down. It was on the second level, was a driveway down there. And then there was a parking lot for an apartment complex that was right next to it. And in the middle of the night, I woke up to loud shouting, uh, loud, aggressive shouting and swear words and those kinds of things. And I peeked out my blinds to see what was going on. And there was a handful of police officers and a couple of armed men, and they were pointing guns at each other. They were screaming at each other, yelling at each other. And uh, one of the men shot out a couple of uh, bullets and they both ran away. Uh, across the uh, way and try to get around the apartment building. Uh, Praise the Lord. The police officers were able to uh, track them down, apprehend them and arrest them. Sarah and I lived in a neighborhood uh, that was really quite dangerous. Uh, Madison, Wisconsin is a very nice community. If you know anything about Madison, it's a college town, very affluent, lots of wonderful neighborhoods. Uh, But they have a housing crisis where houses are uh, really just the prices are unmanageable. Hey, buddy. How are you doing? You want to come up and preach with me? No. But Madison has a a problem with their housing where house prices are unmanageable, uh, really unlivable. So there are very few places in Madison that have uh, affordable housing uh, that you can afford at a living wage. And we lived in one of those neighborhoods. Within a 10-minute walk of our house, there were 15,000 people that lived there. Apartment buildings scattered our house. We were the only single family home in our neighborhood. And we were one of only a handful of white families in our neighborhood as well. It was under-resourced. There wasn't a lot of public transportation that went through our neighborhood. It was also what's called a food desert which means that there is no grocery store within walking distance from the neighborhood. And so uh, many of our neighbors, where they went to go get groceries was the gas station next to our church building. They would walk across our backyard. The church kind of had a double lot. And so they had an open field, we had an open field behind us and they would walk through our backyard and go to the gas station and get their supper. They would walk back to their apartment and have it. Uh, At one point while we were living there, uh, there was a shootout between two gang members across the street from the elementary school that was in our neighborhood. Right by the elementary school was a bike path that people could walk or ride bikes on. And on the other side of the the bike path was a neighborhood called Arbor Hills. And Arbor Hills was a beautiful neighborhood, much like you would think of in Madison, Wisconsin. Huge houses, you know, 2,000 square foot plus, respectable professionals, these kinds of things. So we lived in an area that literally you cross the bike path, you cross the tracks, and it was like a different world over there. Beautiful big parks and lots of greenery and these kinds of things. 
And this neighborhood, uh, these two neighborhoods both fed into the elementary school. And so the elementary school had quite a diverse group of students, uh, both by race and by economic status. And after we had the incident with the gang members across the street from the elementary school, they held a town hall at the school. And uh, I went there as uh, the pastor in that neighborhood and uh, because we were the only church in that neighborhood as well. So I went there along with some of my parishioners were there also. Uh, There were a few of us there from our neighborhood, which of course didn't have a name. And there were many, many people from the Arbor Hills neighborhood, this professional, respectable neighborhood. And the folks from Arbor Hills uh, demanded that we do something because the neighborhood was getting too dangerous. There was lots of pearl clutching about how bad the neighborhood had gotten. Uh, Praise the Lord. There was a political leader there, an older person who had grown up in a neighborhood like mine uh, that we lived in and uh, was currently living in Arbor Hills. And she was able to do a good job of easing the tension and having good conversation. While we lived there, uh, there was a lady that attended our church in our neighborhood. Her name was Val. And she was a short, kind of rotund, stocky lady. And she was loud and opinionated. Uh, I don't know if she realized just how like loud her voice was, but when she talked, you just like, like everybody heard everything that she was talking about all the time. And she was just a wonderful lady uh, who didn't attend our church when I first got there. Then she started attending and she came up to me and said, Hey, pastor, just want to let you know that I used to attend this church, but I didn't like the pastor that was before you. So I left the church. And now that you're here, I'm back and I'm going to kind of check out how things are going. Now as a pastor, this is a red flag. And you think, all right, this person's going to be a troublemaker. All right. Uh, Because she was opinionated. She let me know what she thought. And I thought, I do not want to deal with this lady. I do not want her here. I do not, I do not look forward to her being around our church. In the 14 months that we lived in that neighborhood, uh, while we were pastoring that church, uh, she brought about five people to the Lord, her neighbors, people who had never heard about Jesus. And she told them about Jesus She uh, helped bring them into the faith. She started Bible studies in her home uh, for many of her neighbors. And the one Easter that we were there, uh, we baptized 10 people um, on an Easter. And we were only a church of about 40 or 45. So we baptized 10 people, uh, people who were from our neighborhood and not a single one was from Arbor Hills. It turns out that the board that I had at that church, who was uh, mostly older, respectable, professional men, uh, turned out that they uh, didn't really like some of the decisions I was making, the direction that I was going, or the people that were in our church. So this lady that I thought was going to be a troublemaker turned out to be the one who was building the kingdom the most in our church. And the people that I thought would be allies for the mission of the Lord uh, worked hard to stop it. What we're going to find out today in our scripture is that the Lord has a tendency and is in a habit to use the people that we least expect to build his kingdom. We're going to find out today that Jesus had some scummy friends and those were the people that he used to build the kingdom. And this is what we hear in our scripture beginning in verse nine. As Jesus was walking along, He saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth and he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. So Jesus is kind of in the middle of his ministry and he walks uh, up to a man uh, named Matthew, also known as Levi, who was sitting at a tax booth. Uh, Matthew was a tax collector. And he also, since he was at the booth, chances are that he was kind of a boss. He was probably not the one who was out on the streets collecting taxes. He was probably the guy who was organizing all the people who were out on the street collecting taxes. Something that you need to know at this point is that Israel was under the thumb of the Roman empire. They had oppressors over them and the Roman empire heavily taxed uh, places that they uh, ruled over and especially places that didn't jive with their theological and ideological beliefs. So Israel being faithful to the God of Israel, to Yahweh, uh, they didn't like that. So they would heavily tax these areas like Israel. And when they recruited uh, Israelites, Jewish people to collect taxes uh, from their neighbors, these Israelites were essentially treasonous. 
They were essentially turncoats. They turned away from their neighbors, from their people, from their nation, and they assisted the Roman Empire in collecting taxes and oppressing their Jewish brothers and sisters. So they were treasonous. They were turncoats. They were also greedy. We uh, know from even extra biblical sources that many of these tax collectors would uh, say that the empire was charging more than the empire actually was. And then they would just pocket the rest. They would pass off what they needed to, and they would just pocket the rest while also getting paid by the Roman empire to do their work. This is uh, the story of Zacchaeus, you may remember. Zacchaeus, the wee little man, a wee little man was he, where he climbed up in the sycamore tree. And he uh, uh, came to know Jesus. And this is part of his story is that he paid back all the extra that he had stolen from people that he had overcharged. Tax collectors at this time were the worst of the worst. They were the scum of the earth, the scummiest, low lifes, treasonous. They were, they were hated by their communities. No one liked tax collectors. And oftentimes these tax collectors had to interact with Gentiles. And so they were ritually unclean. To be a tax collector, you were not someone of good repute. You were not somebody who was active in the worship of Yahweh. You were a scummy, lowlife, good for nothing, nobody, if you were a tax collector. And here, Jesus calls Matthew to follow him. And rabbis would do this. Uh, They would go up to people and they would say, follow me. This is kind of a formal uh, uh, welcome invitation to begin to sit under the rabbi, to learn his teachings. Oftentimes that meant leaving your livelihood. Not always, but sometimes it meant that. And for Matthew, what this meant is that he had to leave behind his tax booth. Now, uh, probably the Roman empire would not have hired him back to begin collecting taxes if he just left on the job. And also if Matthew was a tax collector, there was nobody who would hire Matthew. So when Matthew left his tax booth, he left everything. He left his job. He left his uh, financial security. He left the possibility of him having future jobs. He gave up a lot, probably more than many of the other disciples. Because we hear that the other disciples, after Jesus was crucified, but before they saw him again, those couple of days, they went back to fishing. They just went back to their old job because they still had their boats. They still had their nets. They still could work. Matthew probably didn't have that opportunity, but instead he left everything behind. And we continue on. And as he sat at dinner in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came and were sitting with him and his disciples. So we see here that Matthew is not resigned to follow Jesus. He's not sad about following Jesus, but he actually throws a party in celebration. As he invites the Lord to dinner, Matthew also invites his friends, the other tax collectors and the other sinners to participate in this celebration. Matthew's not sad here. He's throwing a party to say that he's following Jesus now and other tax collectors was there. And this word sinners is just kind of a catch all for anybody who is outside of normal society. Anybody who doesn't really participate in uh, the worship of Yahweh, people who are um, oftentimes do jobs of uh, disrepute. So we're talking uh, people who are mercenaries, these kinds of things, prostitutes, all this kind of stuff that people who are not respectable, people who are not part of normal society, this is what sinners are. And almost certainly, these people were not going to temple regularly. They were not going to synagogue regularly. They were not doing all the sacrifices necessary to become clean and pure so they could worship Yahweh. So these people were unclean. They were ritually impure. And that's why here the Pharisees are so upset. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Because for us, eating is a pretty casual thing. When you go on a tailgate or you, you know, have, a, have a little cocktail party or whatever, right? It's a pretty casual thing. But in this culture, to eat with somebody meant that you were associating with them that you were close to them, that you were working with them on something or that you were partners in some kind of venture. And so here Jesus is closely associating himself with tax collectors, sinners, 
those who are outside of normal society and those who are of disrepute, those who are defiled, those who are unclean. Because for the Pharisees, they thought that being holy and righteous and good meant that you were separated from those things that were unclean and defiled. It meant that you didn't touch the thing that was unclean because then you would become unclean. But here Jesus is interacting and probably physically touching just even just, you know, back paths and that kind of stuff with people who are ritually impure. People who are sinners, the worst of the worst, the scummiest lowlifes in the community. And here Jesus is eating with them. We know that Jesus did this regularly. We hear about it in Luke 15. Luke 19, Luke 7. We hear that Jesus at one point, he is accused of being a glutton and a drunkard because he spent so much time at these kinds of gatherings with people who were also gluttons and drunkards. People who were outside of normal society, maybe even outside of Israel's worship of Yahweh. And here Jesus is interacting with them. The Pharisees can't understand this because it doesn't fit in their framework, their idea of what a religious leader and especially not the Messiah should do. Because for the Pharisees, as they were thinking about religious leaders and especially the Messiah, what they were supposed to do is overthrow the Roman empire, get out from under the thumb of the Roman empire to, to make Israel a nation that all other nations can look to and come to and get benefit from. For them, the Messiah or religious leaders are supposed to make Israel pure and holy and upright and overthrow the Roman government. Yet here Jesus is associating with those who are treasonous, associating with those who are impure, associating with those who do not worship God, do not worship Yahweh, and certainly don't respect the purity laws of the scriptures. And they couldn't understand it. And this is how Jesus responds. But when he heard this, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. You see what the Pharisees didn't understand and what Jesus did understand is that it was always part of God's plan to include and heal the scummiest lowlifes of the community. That was always part of the deal. It was always part of the plan that those who are far from God would be included in the kingdom of God. That the scummiest that the community has to offer are going to be the ones who are brought close to our Lord and included in this new kingdom that God is going to be built. That this isn't a bug of the system but it's actually a feature of the system. And we hear about this later from Paul who writes, um, this is after Jesus's resurrection. Paul is a church leader, a pastor, an evangelist, missionary. He goes out and starts all these churches. And this is what he writes in his letter to the Corinthian church in the first chapter and part of the introduction. He says this, consider your own call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world. Things that are not to reduce to nothing things that are so that no one might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Jesus Christ, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption in order that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. You see, it was always part of God's plan to use the scum of the earth, the lowlifes, the nobodies, the dirty, rotten scoundrels to proclaim the gospel simply for the fact that it shames those who are respectable, who are wise and who are strong. God chooses still actively chooses to use the scummiest low lives to build the kingdom so that those of us who are respectable are put to shame. That's the point. 
is to actually humble us, those of us who consider ourselves respectable. And we actually can see this in our world right now. Because here in the Western world that is built on the foundation of uh, Christian virtue and Christian faith in a world that is, that is uh, we have so much access to uh, medical care and to money and to housing and to sanitation, to clean food. We have everything you could possibly want. And the church in the Western world is declining and the church is growing in those places that we would say are dangerous. The places that we would say are unclean, like physically unclean, unsanitary. In those places that don't have access to money and to resources and to medical care, those are the places that the church is growing and exploding. And you know what? It puts us to shame. It puts us to shame that leaders in other countries in what we would call the developing world are actually sending missionaries here because they see the church in the United States in such a bad situation. And they say, y'all need Jesus. It shames us in a society that's built on Christian virtue and has so much comfort and access that we're the ones who are failing the kingdom. We're the ones who are getting it wrong. And the whole point is to humiliate us, to make us realize that it is not those who are respectable that build the kingdom, but it is the dirty, rotten scoundrel. It is the low life. It is the scummy scum of the earth. And that idea is actually later in Corinthians as well. Corinthians chapter four, first Corinthians chapter four, where Paul says that the apostles, even the respectable ones, the ones that have good jobs, the ones that have authority, the ones that are respectable, that the apostles have become the scum of the earth. That word is actually from the scripture. That phrase, scum of the earth, is from the scripture. He says, we have become the scum of the earth. He says, we've become the refuse, the waste of the world in order that the gospel might be proclaimed. You see, it's backwards from everything that we expect. That those who are the lowest of low are the ones ordained by God to build the kingdom so that those of us who are respectable might be put to shame, might be humiliated for this very reason, that the one who boasts must boast in the Lord. We also, um, uh, as Jesus continues, he says this to the Pharisees. He says, go and learn what this means. This is Jesus. This is a very kind of like rude, almost sassy thing to say. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. He tells these Pharisees to leave his presence and go re-examine the scriptures. And he quotes to them Hosea chapter six, verse six, where Hosea is an Old Testament prophet who outlines God's accusations against Israel, that they are inhospitable, that they don't care for the orphan or the widow. And it climaxes with this phrase in Hosea chapter six, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. You see, the sacrifice, the sacrificial system was all about becoming pure so you could enter into the worship of Yahweh. You would make sacrifices to cleanse you of your sin so that you could worship God. But God is telling the Israelites that he desires mercy and not sacrifice. The Pharisees thought that that holiness, that righteousness, that goodness meant being separate from the unclean. means being separate from those things that defile. But Jesus uh, reframes this. He changes the definition for us. In fact, he desires mercy. That holiness is not so much being separate from that which is unclean, but it's actually being close to Jesus. It's being close to where Jesus is. And where is Jesus? He tells us in Matthew 25. This is later in the gospel of Matthew. This is what Jesus says. He's talking about the end times. He says, he says the king is going to return. He's referring to himself. The king's going to return. He's going to gather all the nations. He'll divide the right from the left, the sheep from the goat. The, the one on the right are going to enter into eternal life, the eternal kingdom. The ones on the left will not, but this is what he says here. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, come, 
you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you as a stranger and welcomed you or naked and gave you clothing? When was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And Jesus says, truly, I tell you, just as you did it to the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. You want to know where Jesus is? He's with the sick, the lonely, the hungry, the homeless, the prisoner. That's where Jesus is. Holiness, goodness, righteousness is not about being separated from that which is unclean, but it's actually being close to Jesus. And he is with those who are unclean, which is why he says, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. He wants us to draw close to those who are hurting. He wants us to draw close to the lowest, lowest, low lives in our community. Draw close to those who are the scummiest in our community. Draw close to those who are the most unrespectable in our community. Because that's where he is. He's there. He's already at work. If you want to find Jesus, go find the homeless person. Go find the low life. Go find the prisoner. That's where Jesus is at work. And Jesus says, serve me by serving these people. Take care of me by taking care of the low lives. Why? Because it shames the wise. It humiliates the powerful. It humiliates those who are respectable. And this is so backwards from everything that we think, everything that we think is good and right, because we're told to get a good job. We're told to uh, take care uh, and get a good house. We're told to make sure that we are liked and respected by our neighbors in our community. And the invitation of Jesus is just the opposite. The invitation of Jesus is to draw close to those and befriend those who are unrespectable, those who are dirty, those who are unclean, those who are scummy, those who are the lowlifes. And in fact, as we proclaim the gospel, just like the apostles, we ourselves are also going to become the scum of the earth. We are going to become unrespectable in it. We're going to become the lowlifes because we are associating and loving those who are the low lives. I wish there was some sort of nuanced interpretation I could give you to Matthew 25. But if you read through Matthew 25, it's going to give you an existential crisis because Jesus says it about as clear as can be. If you want to be part of the kingdom, you will serve and love and befriend and associate with the tired, the sick, the hungry, the homeless, the prisoner, the criminal. If you want to be part of his kingdom, that's where it's going to lead you every single time. And in fact, he even says that it's a matter of faith. Your faith is in the balance because if you're following Jesus and he doesn't lead you there, you have the wrong ideas about Jesus. You're like the Pharisees thinking that separation is the answer. Instead, it's proximity, closeness, participation with those who are hurting. I know this is a tough teaching, but this is why it's a scandal. This is why it was scandalous to the Pharisees to see Jesus behave this way, to become unrespectable, to become a low life, to become the scum of the earth. Because it goes against everything that we think is right and good. Um, I want to take a moment um, because I'm guessing, I know in my own heart, uh, as I've, you know, wrestled with this text from Matthew 25 for many, many years. Um, and as I re-wrestled with it this week, um, I know it produces all kinds of feelings in my heart. Um, first off, it produces defensiveness. Uh, Cause I think certainly this can't be true. Right. I think, am I doing enough? kind of scared 
if Jesus will accept me into his kingdom, because I don't know if I'm doing enough. And maybe that's what's rising up in you. That's a good place to be. Um, so we're going to take some time to, to pray through that. Um, but maybe you are somebody who is unres- unrespectable. Maybe you are somebody who is a low life and maybe it gives you hope. And if so, know that the Lord is very near to you. And the Lord is with you. And he was a low life also. He was the scum of the earth also. Um, so yeah, so let's just take a moment. Um, I want you to just present to the Lord uh, whatever emotions you're feeling. If it's defensiveness, if it's inspiration, if it's fear, um, if it's hope, whatever that is, um, let's just take uh, a few seconds here. And I just want you to confess that to God. Uh, tell him what you're feeling.